I'm Claire Hubble, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss the latest donations of weapons and armoured cars from the West to Ukraine, plus the latest from the Wagner Group prison conscripts who were recruited to fight for the Russian army. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy markets the world over. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Thursday, the 5th of January, day 316. Today, to discuss the most recent events in Ukraine and around the world, I'm joined by our Brussels correspondent Joe Barnes and Russia correspondent Natalia Vasilyeva. This conversation was recorded prior to Putin's order of a Christmas ceasefire in Ukraine, an announcement we will discuss in further detail on tomorrow's episode. I started by asking Natalia for the most significant updates in the military sphere over the past 24 hours. Hi, everyone, and hi, Claire. Yes, absolutely. I think we can start with Russia and Vladimir Putin specifically, who yesterday um, officially sent off Russian warship on a lengthy mission. And as him and his defense minister, minister has described it, there's one thing special about this mission. It's not about the actual warship, uh, which is a Russian frigate called the Admiral Gorshkov. But it's the fact that it's going to be equipped with, with new hypersonic cruise missiles which will make it a first, um, Russia's first uh, warship that would be carrying sea-based missiles. We don't know any specifics about the route yet, but what we know for sure is that it's supposed to be going on a, what they call combat duty in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans and the Mediterranean, which means that it will probably be passing by Britain at some point. Again, Russia has used uh, sea-based missiles against Ukraine before. Here we're talking about Russia's state-of-the-art, a new Circon hypersonic weapon. And according to Vladimir Putin, um, as he said yesterday, such powerful weapons will make it uh, possible to protect Russia from potential external threats. Whether he intends to use it again against you, obviously no one knows at this point, but it would definitely be quite a costly thing to do because unlike the missiles that Russia has been using in Ukraine, Circon is pretty much one of the kind. And uh, obviously it's they're not, this kind of uh, missiles is not as easily replaceable as uh, older and clunkier missiles, so to speak. Another story that we had in our headlines this morning is um, Zaporizhia, Ukraine's central region that is partially occupied by Russia, although um, most of Zaporizhia is under Ukrainian control, but it has seen some very heavy fighting in recent weeks. And uh, according to the general staff of Ukraine's armed forces, Russia has suffered heavy losses in this region. Specifically, Kiev officials suggested that up to 10 units of military equipment of different types have been destroyed with, as they said, 200 soldiers wounded or killed. Again, there's no independent confirmation for that especially because the Russian military have not made any death toll public for a very long time. Uh, Another thing that uh, happened uh, this morning is uh, another suspected Ukrainian uh, drone attack on Crimea. Apparently, Ukraine launched two uh, drones over the Belbek military airfield in Crimea. But according to Russia's occupation authorities in this peninsula, they were all shot down. Another thing I would like to mention is the head of Ukraine's intelligence agency gave a a, um, broad, a a wide-ranging interview to ABC News yesterday in which he suggested that Russia has been using its soldiers, some of its soldiers, as a human shield, essentially. He said that they estimated about 800 Russian soldiers were killed um, in just the day before he gave that interview mostly in fighting in eastern Ukraine. And he said that they have intelligence saying that Russia has been using bodies of dead soldiers as a shield, essentially. He said those bodies were, quote, left rotting away in the open field, uh, piled um, 
on top of each other. Another thing I would like to mention is quite an unusual intervention this morning from the head of the Russian Orthodox Church on Ukraine. I would just go back and very quickly say that Patriarch Kirill, which is the who is the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, has been quite clear about his and the church's position on the war in Ukraine. As soon as the invasion started, he uh, very much sided with the Kremlin. He accused Ukrainian leadership of um, being puppets in the hands of the West, and he fully he's been fully supportive of what we have seen as a devastating invasion. Whereas, if we look back eight or nine years from now, we would see um, him being quite cautious on the issue of the annexation of Crimea and uh, Russia's support for separatists. Now, this time around, Patriarch Kirill is quite clear that he is siding with Putin 100%. And in the middle of all of that, we just uh, heard from him this morning, he issued a statement calling on both sides in the war to observe the Christmas truce, which again is quite unusual coming from, from him. You would definitely expect a priest or some member of a religion to be advocating for peace from the start like Pope Francis did. Kirill has not called on Moscow, for example, to stop the hostilities, to stop bombing Ukraine, but this time he's calling for truce. Um, obviously, there are different ways to interpret that statement. Uh, Kirill is essentially now part and parcel of the Kremlin system, of the Kremlin leadership. It is quite possible that he's merely translating, that he's merely channeling a, a message um, from the Kremlin who might be eager for a bit of a break, a bit of a breather. Um, but yes, let's see. Let's see how it goes so far. Ukraine says that it has no uh, intention to stop the hostilities, especially as they are liberating their land and they're fighting for own citizens. Uh, again, when we're talking about Christmas truce, uh, truce we're, uh, we're talking about Orthodox uh, Christmas, uh, which is uh, tomorrow, actually, tomorrow is Orthodox uh, Christmas Eve. Thank you for that, Natalia. And of course, listeners may remember uh, back in World War One, there was the Christmas truce on the Western Front in 1914. Mm. I just I wonder what you think the likelihood of this going ahead would be. So far, uh, it looks there is absolutely no intention from Russia or Ukraine to stop it. Again, Russia might want a breather. Ukraine might want one as well. But as we have seen, the Ukrainians has been very clear about the fact that at this time, at this stage of the war, it looks like Russia is the one who really needs a break, who really needs time to regroup, to train its soldiers, to, to have a bit of to give its soldiers a bit of a rest. And Russia would be the one benefiting from how long this break might last. And Ukrainians have been quite rightly suspicious of the intentions between behind any cause for any truce. So I would be very much surprised if someone decided to actually go ahead with it. We definitely don't see you, the key of leadership has made it clear they're not doing it. On the, on the one hand, we haven't seen the Kremlin officially supporting this call. Before we move on, I believe you've been working on a story this morning about the Wagner Group's prison recruits. What can you tell us about that story? Yeah, this is just another episode of uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the uh, infamous head of the uh, merc- of the private military contractor Wagner, getting increasingly public and increasingly vocal. Um, uh, a Russian state news agency released a video this morning that shows Prigozhin touring what appears to be a recreation facility, apparently for uh, for his recruits. Um, and he's seeing addressing those recruits and um, uh, at at the end of the at the end of the con- contract that they apparently signed six months ago. But the most interesting part here is that these are not ordinary mercenaries. This is th- this is appears to be the first batch of Russian convicts that he personally recruited at Russian prisons this summer. Um, uh, we see those men in the video; their faces are blurred. It's not uh, possible to verify their identities. But Prigozhin is heard um, telling those men in that video that they did a good job, that their contract has just expired, uh, they did their bit, uh, and they're coming back home. They're not coming back to prison. And as we know, uh, Prigozhin has um, recruited several thousand people in Russian prison. A lot of them were serving lengthy sentences, um, often for violent crimes. Um, and Prigozhin in that video... Uh, quite funnily, told those men to behave, quote, uh, not to get hammered, 
use drugs or rape chicks. Uh, chicks is the chick is the word that he actually used. So I'm, I'm quoting him um, word on word. Um, and he also made it very clear that he is going to stand behind those men that they, as he put it, deserve the respect of society. Um, and some of those men were, were heard saying in that video that they would love to come back. They would love to sign another contract with Wagner to, as they put it, finish off um, what they started. Um, in Ukraine, again, it, it just looks at another piece of Prigozhin propaganda. Uh, clearly aimed to project his own personal influence, just like this bit when he says that, uh, when he t when he tells those ex convicts that you know if you run into any troubles back home, just call me or or call our company. You know we're gonna sort it. That, you know we will talk to the your police chief or your governor. Uh, but anyway, quite extraordinary that he insists that those men are actually going home. They're not going back to prison and they're going to be pardoned. And of course, when Prigozhin started that recruitment drive at the Russian uh, prison colonies, um, prisoner rights activists. Um, were quite stunned because this is not something anyone has seen before, that a private individual would just walk into a prison and start and say, you know, I want those guys to come and work for me, which is, of course, extraordinary. There's no legal basis for that. Um, uh, no one at the Kremlin or um, any other parts of Russian government has been able to explain um, why he's been allowed to do it and like what what the legal lo grounds for that because there are none and apparently now they're going to walk free um and again if you look at the russian law there are no provisions for anything like that um uh, there's no way those men are going to be pardoned um um in ordinary circumstances um but yeah let's see let's see what happens to them uh when they get back I'm curious, Natalia, whether you have any sort of information on what life is like inside a Russian prison. Well, obviously, conditions are very grim, and a lot of people who were um, recruited by Wagner they um, they had long stretches of of time uh, in front of them. Uh, some of them had another ten or fifteen years to serve. Um, so it's not. Uh, it, that, that's why it wasn't surprising to me that a lot of them decided to play this Russian roulette with death, essentially. Um, because as as we know, a lot of uh, convicts recruited by Wagner were actually killed very, very early on, as soon as they were um, uh, sent to Eastern Ukraine. Um, but again, um, Russian prisons are typically um, quite violent places, Um and in a lot of cases, uh, inmates have very little contact with the outside families. So um, a lot of them banked on and like happily took up that proposal, thinking that it would be one of their um, few chances to go back. On the other hand, uh, um, there's a number of relatives of um, of, of the convicts um, who spoke to Russian media saying that their men were about to go to Ukraine. They were quite tempted uh, by uh, this proposition, but their wives and uh, families managed to talk them out of it, saying that, you know, you're basically playing with your life and what, whatever happens, like if something happens to you on the front line, it's, um, it's not something that can be changed. Like, you know, maybe it's better to, to stay in prison for another year or for another decade or two. At least you're going to, you know, uh, get out of there alive, hopefully. So that's that's how it goes. Moving on to you, Joe, I believe you have some updates on the world and diplomacy spaces. So please take us away. Hi, folks. And it comes down to the, the argument, is it or is it not a tank? Because um, what I'll start with today is overnight, uh, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, promised Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, that France would donate an series he didn't Emmanuel Macron didn't name and put a number out in the space but he said he would France would give over to Ukraine these AMX 10 armored combat vehicles um to the untrained eye to to, to me at first I, I kind of took a glancing fleeting glance at it looks like a tank um so the the AMX 10 is a four man described as an armored reconnaissance vehicle rather than a tank but it is equipped with a 105 millimeter cannon on top um, which is, is used for hitting 
tanks it is described as being able to travel when on road and on off off terrain off 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 road terrain so it's it's a really useful sort of um bit of kit that france has given over um but what it has done is it's reignited this row over whether western made tanks should be given by nato allies over to ukraine so france has called it an armored vehicle but Kiev this morning uh, via the Ukrainian Defense Ministry to, to, to call it a light tank, um, which is what's basically reignited. And I, I, will, I, will, I will read out the tweet that was sent uh, by the Ukrainian Defense Ministry. And it said, experts continue to debate whether the AMX-10 RC can be considered a tank. In any case, the decision of President Emmanuel Macron is another step that will bring our victory closer, especially when the AMX-10 RCs are joined by their American and we believe German peers. Uh, and this is where the row really got, got on because um, the likes of the Poles have handed over kind of former Soviet era tanks, like proper heavy battle tank. Um, but Ukraine has been asking Germany for its Zhepard, its Leopard tank. Uh, for many many months now and it hasn't been germany hasn't been forthcoming for fears it might escalate the conflict further in russia's eyes so here you have a area and a stick that the ukrainians are using to beat the germans again by suggesting that we we they say we believe the germans are going to donate some sort of light tank or fighting vehicle over to their cause um but that's unforeseen yet we're, we're so and a and Alina Baerbock, the German foreign minister, is in London today. And I you know a few of our correspondents on the ground there are really keen to kind of grill her on what Germany is going to do next. But there are also questions over what Britain's going to do next. Um, so America has announced it's going to donate Bradley fighting vehicles, um, which are very similar to the AMX 10RCs. Um, but there's no kind of word on what Britain could do next in the front of these kind of heavily armed fighting vehicles that will give Ukraine better mobility, um, an asset to seize land quickly when trying to win back territory from Russia. Uh, but that's a, so that's a really interesting debate, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about that in the coming days. And um, one thing I would say is I, I would say this is a step up in France's donations. France is often criticised for its kind of lack of donations, um, but actually this is this is a really useful step, and I'm I'm sure that. Uh, the Ukrainian soldiers would be very pleased to have it, even if it is an outdated bit of, bit of tech, essentially. It's, uh, it was made in the 1980s. France is only handing it over because they've got kind of a new capability that is being kind of rolled out. Um, and Emmanuel Macron seemingly changed his language as well when he was announced, making his, his announcement for this. He, he said, we, we are... Sorry. Um, we, he said, we are with going to back Ukraine... Uh, until it's all for the victory, which is often something he's not spoken about. He's often spoken about not wanting to humiliate Russia and Vladimir Putin, um, and coming up with a negotiated outcome. So actually, this is a this is a kind of a welcome step from Emmanuel Macron in the eyes of the um, in the eyes of kind of the West and in, in Kiev, I'm sure. Um, and then I'll, I'll move on. So Norway has offered to donate or has donated 10,000 artillery shells to Ukraine, which are to be used with the M109 howitzers that have already been given to Kiev by Norway. NATO General Secretary uh, Jens Stoltenberg has warned allies that it would be dangerous to underestimate Russia, even if the country is on a back foot and seemingly losing the war in Ukraine. He told a business conference in, U in Norway, they have shown a great willingness to tolerate losses and suffering. We have no indication that President Putin has changed his plans and goals in Ukraine, so it's dangerous to underestimate Russia. And what he's talking about there is, and it's the age-old question is, what are Vladimir Putin's goals still? If you speak to Western uh, military sources, Western intelligence sources, they will say that they believe Vladimir Putin still has his maximalist goals for Ukraine, and that means taking Kiev at some point. And I think people in Kiev are also... Um, Talking, uh, talking about new kind of offensives and Russia planning new offensives on Kiev. So that's one to keep an eye out for. Um, we also have Poland has signed a deal to buy a second batch of US 
Abrams tanks. So Poland's defence minister has signed a deal to buy the batch of kind of battle tanks as Warsaw beefs up its own defensive capabilities. But what I will say um, that it also is good news for Ukraine because it means that Poland will have more and more surplus of their old Soviet stock that they have been willing to uh, donate over to uh, Kiev. And then um, the one other interesting point is the uh, the French court has heard an extradition request for billion for a Ukrainian billionaire, oh sorry, Russian billionaire Kostanant Zhvago, who controls a London listed iron iron pellet company, and he was arrested and detained in France in late December. So Ukraine's State Bureau for Investigation has uh, basically has him on the wanted list. Um, and so I called him a Russian. He's actually he served in the Ukrainian Parliament um, before. Um, so I read my notes slightly wrong. Uh, but he's basically wanted on suspicion of embezzlement and money laundering linked to the disappearance of $113 million. So this is a sign of Ukraine and Western governments, be it France this time, working in a slightly different capacity to what we know and know in the military space, in the diplomatic space, they're actually now putting kind of judicial uh, issues and working together on them. And that's a, that's a good step for all involved. Um, and I'll stop there for now. I'll stop rambling. I'm really interested to come back to France's pledge to send more military support in the form of AMX-10 armoured combat vehicles. As it's my understanding that the West won't send tanks, as this will be perceived as an escalation of the conflict. But looking at pictures of these vehicles, they, they look remarkably like tanks. And if it walks like a tank and talks like a tank, I wonder if this would be perhaps received as an escalation of the conflict regardless. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you're you you you're, you're right. They to the, to the untrained eye, they are a tank as far as I'm as far as I'm concerned. Um, they don't hold the kind of the power and the armor capabilities of an actual battle tanker. What well, the French would have a Leclerc, a American Abrahams, um, Abrams, sorry, um, a Challenger in the British fleet of tank, um, a German German Leopard. They, they're not as powerful and strong as that, but they, for all intents and purposes, they they do look like tanks um and it's it, this has it's, it's, it's in really it's ignited this great kind of twitter debate where everyone from kind of military analysts to think tankers um who deal in kind of brexit circles or eu affairs are all trying to weigh in on this and um i think safe to say is the front um who own the capability they don't call it a tank so that's where we should start so this isn't france sending a battle tank um, the Ukrainians are described as a light tank, as I've, I've as I said. So, I, I, I think that's why they see this as a comfortable um, point and not escalatory. Um, so, the, the similar looking things have been donated by the Australians in the Bushmaster um, kind of armored vehicles class. Uh, they they aren't loaded with kind of big cannons on them, but they they have big machine guns strapped to them and stuff like that, and are used in a very in the, in the same way, so they're kind of armored armored fighting vehicles rather than actual battle tanks. So, um, but this is this is the case. We we we've seen we've seen Soviet era tanks given over to Ukraine. So, and Ukraine have been asking for Western era t uh, Western kind of made NATO standard tanks ever since the start of the war, and no one has really been able to answer why it's such a taboo. Um, I, I think the the one reason is actually that Western tanks are harder to to upkeep. Um, they require more fuel than the Soviet era tanks that have been handed over so far, and probably the, the spare parts just aren't there. Is uh, that's that's one of the main the main real issues here is actually can can a rather not the Ukrainians being able to keep up the maintenance all that are the Western governments able to assist in in that because they will need kind of western made parts constantly and they just aren't aren't as free on the market as potentially some of the soviet era stuff so i, I would say that it's not we're not wanting to give over tanks it's the fact that they don't britain especially just doesn't have enough tanks to donate to uh ukraine um and that's that's an interesting kind of debate in itself that we could take it off on a slight tangent that there's a how 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 much and how much more can the West carry on giving Ukraine as this 
as this conflict goes on, we'd we'd all want to we'd all want the West to keep stepping up its capabilities um, and what it's donating. But there are now questions over whether the West has enough stockpiles or kit to defend itself if anything else happens, which obviously seems very unlikely. But that's something the military has to keep in to keep in keep in mind when it's giving its kit away. So I'll stop there for now. Mm, thank you for that, Joe. Natalia, I'd love to hear your perspective, so please do share your thoughts. Uh, yes, sure. Um, I personally think that we're definitely past the stage of will this escalate the war or will this provoke Russia? I mean, Russia invaded Ukraine um, without any rhyme or reason. There was no pretext for that. There was nothing that Ukraine had had done to to provoke this invasion. And over the last few months, we have seen um, uh, the West step up its uh, military supplies, supplying things that would have been unimaginable just before the war. And, you know, if we look back at the history of that conflict, uh, we can think how President Zelensky in um, November, December uh, 2021, just a couple of months before the conflict started, he was clamoring for help. He was clamoring for military aid around the same time that American intelligence was saying that there's an invasion on the cards, that it is going to happen, that it's, it's a reality that everyone should be prepared for. And around that time, what Zelensky was saying, well, if you say there's going to be invasion, you need to give us something that will help uh, us uh, uh, defend our country. Again, nothing was, pretty much nothing was done before the start of the invasion. All of the military supplies that had been coming to Ukraine were really negligible, Um uh, yes, uh, Ukrainian troops have uh, received uh, the training, different kinds of support from Western governments. But at the end of the day, um, on uh, as of twenty uh, fourth of February, twenty twenty two, Ukraine had very little um, in 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 terms of <coughs> pardon um, high tech uh, Western weapons. And it was just in recent months that we saw, for example, um, the United States uh, supplying HIMARS, the this light multiple rocket launchers that became a meme that most recently struck a major Russian base in eastern Ukraine. And weapons like that have really become a game, game changer in, in the ongoing war. But this is all what happened in recent months. And again, if we, if we look back at the history of that war, uh, basically it was the massacres of Bucha and other um, horrific Russian war crimes that we saw in the spring that spurred the West into the action and, and um, uh, helped Ukraine to get what it, what it needed. Again, um, it was just, what, two weeks ago when Vladimir Zelensky was visiting uh, the US when he finally secured um, uh, the first um, batch of uh, Patriot, Patriot um, surface-to-air missiles which should um, help bo- bolster Ukraine's air defense. And again, we're talking about what, 10, 11 months of conflict when Russia has been constantly um, not only shelling east to Ukraine using rather uh, small or mid-range artillery, but using cruise missiles, you were using sea-based missiles against targets um, all over that country. And it's only now that Ukraine is uh, laying its hands on that kind of weapons. And again, as with uh, supplies of HIMARS or with Patriots, I, I remember the same question and the same discussion around the same time saying, well, will it provoke Putin in, in doing something? I mean, uh, uh, what we see is that Putin has no intention of ending this war. And um, um, uh, it's quite interesting because before before the war, he was accusing the West of, as he put it, pumping Ukraine with web weapons while uh, there were no weapons to speak of, to be honest. And uh, um, again, when he talk about, talked about um, red lines for Russia, one of the red lines was that uh, was a further expansion of NATO. And now we see that Sweden and Finland are about to join NATO. Um, and again, Russia didn't do something or there was this, let me put it this way, mysterious attack on the Crimean bridge because Ukraine never publicly claimed responsibility for it. Yes, there were uh, retaliatory strikes on Ukrainian targets from Russia. But we haven't seen any escalation because, you know, th- this whole war obviously is a big escalation. And, um, um, you know, what, what, what else can Russia do? Of course, like there's always nuclear weapons, but, you know, that's, um, that's, that's a different um, subject entirely. Joe, moving on to some additional donations recently made to Ukraine. What can you tell us about the bonus artillery shells provided from France? 
Oh uh, yeah, so we don't actually know when they were really given over, but so what we what we have seen is on Russian military telegram is pictures of these their bonus. 155 millimeter artillery shells but they're they're high tech artillery shells they don't unlike a conventional artillery shell which is just fired out of a shell and then it hits its it hits its kind of target and explodes um this shell kind of splits off and uh another munition a smaller munition that looks a bit like a satellite kind of comes out and then it uses thermal imaging infrared heat detection to lock on to tanks below and then fires itself down in a kind of a in a vertical trajectory um and hit these hit tank or armor um and so they are fired so it's likely um to have been donated by the french because they're used with the caesar self-propelled howitzers that we've seen the French, I believe, have don- donated about 18 of them, or at least promised to, to donate them. But then a so a Russian military telegram channel started sharing pictures of these unexploded submunitions um, that had been recovered by troops um, in the Donetsk region, as the eastern and of Donbass, in the eastern Donbass region, one half of the Donbass. Um, so each kind of bonus shell contains two submunitions which feature fold out wings and advanced sensors. Once fired, the two submunitions are deployed high above the target with each searching the ground for its kind of desired target. And once identified, the munitions lock onto the target using thermal infrared imaging and then attack them from above. The munitions uh, use an explosively formed penetrator, a thin skin of kind of metal that um, turns into a jet of kind of molten material uh, by an explosive charge, and that allows it to kind of penetrate armour below. Um, so we've previously seen Ukraine using a similar system, believed to have been a German one, but this is kind of the first glimpse we've seen of potentially the French made bonus, uh, being used by Ukrainian forces. And it's uh, notably, it's actually made by Nexter, which is the same company that make the AMX 10 kind of light tanks that we were talking about earlier. And, um, the kind of the introduction of bonus, these bonus shells, a lot of Russian military bloggers warning their colleagues that they've got to step up uh, protect, to protect themselves against these. Um, so they, they suggest that, um, so that it's the, the Tankers EU uh, telegram channel for anyone that's interested. So uh, it comes with the usual health warnings. It, it's probably close to the Kremlin. It could be propaganda, but most of the stuff that they say is unverifiable. Um, and they suggest uh, hiding the thermal footprints of systems, so of tanks, um, and then from using previous experiences of the Chechen wars it beca- they said it became clear that ordinary polythene stretching over sleeping militants did not allow them to be found in the greenhouse they kind of use this strange language but essentially they're saying that polythene could be used to hide the heat signature of their of their tanks or armored vehicles and then they also suggest that they should further um that tankers in the Russian army should uh, further try and break up the outline of their vehicles to further spoof the bonus target acquisition systems, and um, so, so there's a genuine concern about these about these systems coming to fruition, and they're they're, they're really interested. We've got a, a graphic online running with with the piece, which shows you how they're fired from a howitzer from some twenty miles away, and then how the shells separate and then find use their targeting systems to land on tank with their armor piercing uh, kind of detonations which is really something that is really is the high-tech way of using artillery it's not just the kind of the russian or the soviet doctrine of kind of fire as much as possible in a certain direction this is actually using real high-tech stuff to pinpoint and it it says that um the guides and the brochures say that when you fire one of these bonus shells you can fire out about 200 meters over a russian tank or a tank or a piece of armor and the tracking and navigation system will be able to then lock on and destroy that tank so it's a, it's a highly useful bit of kit and it's it's the first time that we've seen them used by the ukrainians to my knowledge um thanks to the the fact that one of these things have failed and has been picked up by the russian military and dead on telegram i'll stop there 
Thank you for that, Joe. We're coming to the end of our time this afternoon, so I'd like to come to our final thoughts. Over to you first, Natalia. What would you like to leave our listeners with? Sure, thank you. Um, well, as I mentioned in um, um, one of our previous segments, we're moving on to Orthodox Christmas, which is a big holiday in uh, this part of the world. And as with New Year's Eve, a week ago, there is an expectation that Russia might want to use this holiday period to attack Ukraine and to uh, make people um, um, there even more miserable. Um, again, that comes around the same time that uh, the Ukrainian intelligence uh, came out with its another assessment of Russian military capabilities, saying that Russia probably has enough missiles for two or three major attacks um, um, like we have seen since October. Um, um, again, that's that's their estimate. We don't know um, how close that is for reality. Um, uh, there's no, there are no clear figures about current production rates and what Russia has been able to produce in terms of missiles. Uh, obviously, it has been um, uh, using a lot of them recently. So, um, Definitely this weekend, Friday or Saturday would be something to look out for um, because uh, it's it's quite possible that, you know, Russia would want to um, uh, launch a devastate, devastating strike on um, Ukraine again quite soon. Thank you, Natalia. And over to you, Joe, for your final thoughts. Yeah, so my, 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 my final thoughts would go back to our kind of discussion on the tent and whether the argument that has been used by kind of Western governments, especially Germany, that tanks would be seen as an escalatory step in the eyes of Russia will hold for much longer. So I think France and the US, because they've donated, both donated, become the first Western countries to go donate these sort of light tanks or fighting vehicles as such. Um, I really do think that's going to sort of open the door and it is that the next kind of sort of thing that is going to be given, next sort of product, next sort of capability that's going to be given to the Ukrainians. Um, so they have the the ability to take back land when the counteroffensive can kind of restart. We know, we know they've been slightly paused and bogged down by a muddy winter, muddy cold winter in Ukraine. But you 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 hear the U the Ukrainian military intelligence uh, direct people um, directors they're speaking about starting counteroffensive again in March, and they've they've always telegraphed these uh, counteroffensives quite publicly. We remember that Kherson and Kharkiv offensives were actually spoken about in advance, so. Um, is this the next sort of step? Um, we've we've given Ukraine a lot of kind of multi-launch rocket systems. The High Mars um, and Britain have given our own capabilities over. But now, is it something the Ukrainians need? Is the ability to take back land quickly when they have the Russians on the run, and that is what this capability the French and Americans have donated. So, is that now going to change and slightly break the taboo? Uh, giving across tanks and sort of light lighter tanks these kind of armored fighting vehicles across the ukraine um is seen as escalatory is this now the thing they needed to help ukraine win the war so I, I, i'd like to i'd like to see that think the french and american approach to this has hopefully opened a few doors that will assist with kind of enabling ukraine to win the war so it's kind of fingers crossed on that front and uh while we've been keen to criticize the french a lot this is a good step by them and uh, say well, well done to Emmanuel Macron and his kind of government for taking that step forward into the unknown and giving across a capability that should help Ukraine do some uh, do some good on the battlefield. Today, we thought we'd bring you a snippet from another Telegraph podcast. Our associate editor for politics, Christopher Hope, host of Chopper's Politics podcast, has interviewed former UK MP Brooks Newman about his work this past year in Ukraine. Mr Newmark has spent almost all of the full-scale invasion helping to transport citizens of Ukraine to safety. Here he is, explaining how he first got involved. When I left politics, I'd actually already had a charity in Rwanda, education charity, which I'd had for 15 years. And even though I had an education charity, I knew nothing about education. So I did a master's in education and I had just finished my field research in Rwanda on February 24th. And I was supposed to be going scuba diving with a friend of mine. I spotted on Instagram, a Latvian friend of mine had a bus on the border of Poland. So I, I said to my friend who I was supposed to be going scuba diving with, actually, I want to go to Poland. And so I literally came back to England, got some clothes for cold weather, and then went off to the Polish border with Ukraine. 
and I just thought I was going to go for four days. That's what I told him I was going to do. And um, he had one bus, and we were moving people away from the refugee centers that were getting very crowded and moving people initially to Berlin, Luxembourg, and Paris and Riga. I ended up then staying two weeks. And over time, we started clearing people away from the centers. And I just, uh, my friend from Latvia had to go back to Riga. So I said to him, can you get me three buses? Because I want to go into Ukraine to move people away from Kiev, where the Russians were still trying to sort of push into. And people were trying to get away. And one thing I'd heard was that there were, unfortunately, in war, um, there are a lot of people who take advantage of that. And they were charging people lots of money to move people away. So we ended up offering these bus services for free. And we got very busy. And we were moving people away from mainly Kiev to Lviv and then on to the Polish border. As the Russians got pushed out, I thought, oh, look, you know, I'm going to stay on here. So... I thought, where's the next problem? Um, <laughs> and so I thought, well, people are trying to get away from Mariupol. So I, so I said to myself, well, how are we going to get down there? The bus drivers I've got are, that I'm using are from Lithuania. They don't know the roads. So we contacted one of the national bus companies. And, of course, they have bus drivers, they have buses, but nobody is really using them at the moment. So we then uh, started using them and then from Zaporizhia and from Venezia, we were moving people who were coming up from Mariupol, again, up to Lviv and to the border. Wow. How many in all did you, did you move? Uh, well, at that stage, I probably moved about two and a half thousand, with women and children mainly and some elderly men. I then shifted my operation as Mariupol, you know, as the Russians then got control of Mariupol, there were less people moving away. I then shifted my operation to Dnipro and Kharkiv. I then had sort of two issues that emerged. And at this stage, I'd probably done close to 4,000, I think. I, I had two problems. One was that there were a lot of people that were being taken against their will from a Kharkiv region to Russia. And, and the next issue I had was that it was hard to get bus drivers to go into where there are bombs dropping. So I sort of thought to myself, OK, I'm going to go. You know, I said to the guy running the bus company, I'm going to go. You just need to find any guys who are going to go who wants to go with this crazy Brit that wants to go out to Kharkiv. So I got four bus drivers and two buses. So we went out to Kharkiv and then we started moving people away. But we were finding that a lot of people were nervous about going with us. And the reason why is, as I said, there were people being taken illegally to Russia. So um, and they were very suspicious that it was for free. So I did two things. I did a, a promotional video yeah. with actually the lo a local mayor and, you know, basically sort of saying, hey, I'm here. I'm from the UK. You know, I'd throw in the name Boris Johnson because it was a brand name they all knew. Um, and, you know, we're here to help you. And it, it sort of overcame some of the fear. But the other thing we had to do was to charge people 10 grivni. 10 grivni is about 10p because people felt if they're paying for it, they're not being taken illegally anywhere. Incredible. So they registered online, which was great because then the next thing was I had people's names, I had people's numbers, and I would do ran we would do random calls to make sure people got to where they needed to safely and that they hadn't been ripped off because that was another big concern of mine because we're doing everything effectively for free that uh, I want to make sure that nobody was, no bus drivers or anything were charging them extra money for doing that. So come, I'd say come July, I'd probably moved about 7,500 people. As the war zone kept shifting, there were a lot of people down near Izium. So I started taking buses down to there, and, and um, we would have collection points, and we would start collecting people and so on. So by July... I was getting close to 15,000 people. Goodness, and they all moved where? Towards Poland? Good, good question. Poland. So at this stage, what I'm doing is I'm not taking anybody out the country. Mm. Everybody who I met wanted to stay in Ukraine. What they wanted to do was to get away from the war zone. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm effectively then taking people from Kharkiv, taking them to Lviv, mm. and then in Lviv, 
they're figuring out do they see friends do they you know do they have contacts there and staying in the west of the country because at that stage the west of the country is pretty safe and a lot of times people are contacting me to move so there's other stuff that i'm doing so i would get a call because people heard that we're doing stuff you know can you move this orphanage from a to b and so we ended up i ended up last year ended up moving five separate orphanages three of them to riga where a orphanage there would could take them on look after them one to uh, gdansk and then one to uh, the western part of ukraine Brooks, what an extraordinary testament to your work in ukraine that's extraordinary can may i ask you briefly who's paying for this is it a is the uk government involved is it you personally a charity yeah it's me personally and um friends of mine i've raised money from about 20 friends of mine yeah what's it cost you personally and how much you raised um from your 20 um, friends uh, for me for me i've i've probably by the end of uh, let's say the full year i've probably will have spent about 200 250 thousand dollars myself wow. and will have raised about another five hundred thousand dollars and i have to say the one thing that's amazing out there is there are a lot of of volunteers, you know, British volunteers, other European volunteers who are out in Ukraine doing amazing work, either doing smaller evacuations. So there are people going in, you know, they hear there's a, a an old lady or an old man somewhere. They'll go in and, and, and take them out in ones and twos. But I, I sort of think, well, you know, if I can do a small amount, I can do a large amount. And because of yeah. business background, you know, I'm very organized. I, I really think things through and I'm a problem solver. I mean, the one thing when I was in politics that I enjoyed doing was, you know, listening to people's problems and then trying to come up with solutions for those problems. And that was one of the things, you know, as an MP, I really enjoyed. I enjoyed the the minutiae of helping find solutions for people. And all I've just done is taken the same skill set I had in business that I had in politics now to the voluntary sector, which is problem solving. The, the thing is, the big NGOs that obviously have their protocols, they're concerned with safety and things like that. You know, I, I, as an individual, I can make my own individual risk assessments. I, I, I probably, probably am a bigger risk taker than, than most people. Any family in the area or, or just you've been moved to, to do it? Well, they, uh, that's, a, that's another good question. So, so um, I'm Jewish and during the war... Um, obviously I had a lot of huge amount of relatives from Eastern Europe, uh, yeah. mainly Lithuania and Poland who, um, died in the war, and, but there were a number of people who, you know, really stepped up at the Jews time of need people like obviously Oscar Schindler, Sir Nicholas Winton and so on. And so growing up, these names of Schindler and Winton always resonated with me. And I always admired people who took a risk. Now, obviously, they took a different risk than I did. And certainly, Oscar Schindler took a much bigger risk with his, his personal life. But I, I, I just, this sort of narrative that I grew up with has always stuck with me. So this was really just an opportunity for me to step up as someone who's Jewish to people who are not Jewish. You are, you're a modern day St. Nicholas Winton, aren't you? Well, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm that, but I mean, he, he's a he's a role model is what he is mm. for me. I, I can definitely say that, and he's definitely someone who is always in my mind. Just just growing up, Nicholas, Sir Nicholas Winton was amazing. I mean, beyond amazing, and and um, took them fifty years to really recognize what he did. But um, he did an amazing thing. But there were, as I said, there were other people like Oscar Schindler and so on who also did did great things. And those people, for me, have always been role models and role models growing up. So um, it's just sort of, I guess, became part of my DNA. And this, even though I didn't deliberately go out there to spend whatever, 10 months now uh, in Ukraine mainly, it just sort of one thing led to the next. And I just kept going because there was just kept more and more and more to do it. Chris's full conversation with Brooks Newmark is on his podcast, Chopper's Politics, which you can find by searching wherever you're listening to this. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. 
You get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings you stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Robbie Nichols.